Good evening, everybody. This is Pastor Mike at Calvary Chapel Dotbow, and we're back here again on Wednesday night going through the Old Testament. We're up to the Song of Songs right now, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. I, I've never, just like Ecclesiastes, I've really never heard uh, in all my church years anyone go by verse by verse through the book of uh, Song of Songs. So I'm looking forward to it. And I hope you are too. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time. We can come together and study your word as we go through the Old Testament, Lord. We know that it's important to give us understanding for the new. And um, so we pray that you enlighten us uh, tonight, Lord, that you'll give us understanding, more understanding for your word, and that you'll bless us with it, Lord, and help us to live our lives for you. We thank you for this time. And we do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, the Song of Songs, Chapter 1 tonight. The introduction in Chapter 1. Uh, you know, the original title of this book is Song of Songs, of course. But some have added uh, Song of Solomon to more accurately depict the, the writer of the message as it states in Chapter 1, Verse 1. Solomon wrote 1,005 songs. And the title here indicate that this is the best of his musical works. The word song frequently refers to music that God, or that honors the Lord. So Solomon, who reigned over the kingdom for 40 years, appears seven times by, nine, by name in this book. In the view of his writing skills and musical gifts, the scripture could have been penned at any time during Solomon's reign. Two people dominate this true life dramatic love song, Solomon and the Shulamite maiden. She was likely to have been an unknown maiden from Shunem, whose family had possibly been employed by Solomon in verses eight, uh, chapter 8, 11. She would have been Solomon's first wife in Ecclesiastes 9, 9 before he sinned and added other wives and 300 concubines. And other characters uh, in this story include the daughters of Jerusalem, who might be part of Solomon's household staff in 310. Solomon's friends join in at 15 and 27 and 35 and 58 and 16 and 84. Then we also have the Shulamite's brothers in 8, 8 through 9. All of the 117 verses of the song had been recognized by the Jews as part of their sacred writings, along with Ruth, Esther, Ecclesiastes, and Lamentations, is included among the Old Testament books or the five scrolls. The Jews read this song at Passover, calling it the Holy of Holies. Surprisingly, God isn't mentioned explicitly in this book. The New Testament never quotes Solomon's songs directly, nor does it in Esther, Obadiah, or Nahum. Solomon's love song exalts the purity of marital affection and romance. It parallels and enhances other portions of Scripture which portray God's plan for marriage, including the beauty and sanctity of sexual intimacy between a husband and a wife. The song rightfully stands alongside other scriptures. Other scriptural passages expand on this very thing. That's in Genesis 2.24 and Psalm 45 and Proverbs 5.15-23, 1 Corinthians 7.1-5 and 3.13.8, 1-18, Ephesians 5.18-33. Colossians 3.18 and 19 and 1 Peter 3, 1-7. Hebrews 13.4 captures the heart of this song, where it says marriage should be honored by all and a marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. There exists a misleading idea of hymnology here that Christ is the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys, 
that results from this method that it ultimately pictures Christ's bridegroom love for the church. But a more satisfying way to, of approaching Solomon's song is to take it at face value and interpret it in the normal historical sense. And understanding that the frequent use of poetic imagery to depict reality. When we do that, we understand that Solomon recounts your three things. First is his own days of courtship. Second, the early days of his first marriage. And then thirdly, the maturing of this couple through the good and bad days of life. The Song of Solomon expands on the ancient marriage instruction in Genesis 22-24, thus providing spiritual music for a lifetime of marital harmony. Genesis 2.24 says that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. It is given by God to demonstrate his intention for the romance and loveliness of marriage, which is the most precious of human relationships and the grace of life. As it says in 1 Peter 3.7, with that in mind, let's get to our text here. Verse 1, Solomon's Song of Songs. You know, this verse is most, most often translated along the lines of Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. It may be translated as Song of Songs, which is about Solomon, but evidence throughout the song points to Solomon as the author. The title, Song of Songs, is the same style as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It implies that this is the best of, long, best of his love songs. Then in verse 2, she, she is speaking here. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is more delightful than wine. You know, as we look at the beginning of the book, we don't see the Creator God as we do in Genesis. The delight of the blessed, uh, of the blessed in the Psalms, the value of wisdom and righteousness and justice in Proverbs, or the deep reflection of life as it has in Ecclesiastes. What we do see is the desire of a woman for the kisses on the mouth of her man. As we look further into this book, we'll watch as her desire for him, and likewise his desire for her, turn into dating marriage, and then sex. We will watch as their relationship deepens, as their respect deepens, and as their physical intimacy deepens. As we watch their relationship, it's important to note that it's always presented as good and as pleasing to God. It is shown as following the proper timing, God's timing and within that timing to be delightful to them and to God. Now back to this young girl who desires that her man kiss her with the kisses of his mouth. You know, the author here used a very clever wordplay with the Hebrew for he will kiss me. This sounds similar to give a drink. This leads into the second half of the verse that his love is better than wine. However, it doesn't answer the question of why did she desire him so. She tells us why she desires him. His love was better than wine. Wine can give pleasure, but it's, a it's nothing compared to the deep, soul-satisfying kisses of the one you love, the one you're committed to, and the one who loves and is committed to you. And then verses 3-4, through four, it says, pleasing as the fragrance of your perfumes, your name is like perfume poured out. No wonder the young women love you. Take me, away with, take me away with you. Let us hurry. Let the king bring me to his chambers. You know, the girl then continues her description on some of the reasons his love is better than why. She says that his perfumes have a pleasing fragrance. You know, it's customary in this culture that both women, men and women, apply ointments to their bodies to cover up the smell if they're unable to take a bath 
or to add fragrance after a bath before a festival. The point is that this man cleaned himself up. In today's gentleman, she is simply saying that he has taken a bath and made him look and smell nice. She then continues by saying, your name is like perfume poured out. You know, a person's name is what they are known for. It's their character. When you hear someone's name, you think of, what do you think of? Do you think of someone honest or you think about a liar? Do you think of someone who is generous or the local miser? A person's name represents their character. She is saying that this man is respectable, he is honest, he is hardworking. This man will take care of me, he will treat me well. His name, his reputation is so good that it is like perfume poured out. It's more important that the oils on his body that bring a pleasing fragrance, his name, his character, is more important than his looks and his smell. However, his looks and his smell, his taking care of himself, is, is still important. This man is taking care of his body and has good character. Therefore, this girl desires him. She desires to be with him, to run together with him in life and be intimate with him. His qualities cause not only her love for him, but for all the maidens to love him. All the girls desire him. He is a great guy to have. Men, take a bath. If you've been out working or playing or sweaty or even if you haven't, go take a bath before going on a date and getting together with others. Pay attention to what you're known for. What is your reputation? No, we don't want to be, always be living with the approval of others, but if you're known for your quick temper and your laziness, may want to take a lake, look to see if these are true, and take steps to change these areas in your life. Women, just as, as it says in Proverbs 30, 31, 30, says that charm is, is, is deceitful and beauty is vain. For women, it also holds true for a man. You want a man that you are physically attracted to whose perfumes or oils have a pleasing fragrance, but it's much more important to have the purified oil of a man with good character. Men and women, one question that may come from this is how do I know a man's character? And for men, how do I know a woman's character? First, look at their friends. It is said that a person can't choose their family, but they can choose their friends. What type of friends does a man or woman have? Do you like their friends? Secondly, how do they treat their father and mother? How does a man treat his mother? How does a girl treat her father? Chances are good that they will treat you the same way in the future. Three, how do they get along with their roommates? You know, if they're in a situation where they live in close proximity with others, how do they get along with those that they live with? How are their relationships with others around them? So the best way to know how to find the best spouse is to run hard after God. Spend time with Him and be running in the direction that God has for you. Be doing what he has for you to do. And while you're running on that road, running after God, take a look around to see who's running with you. Then continue running after God. A little while later, take another look around. You may notice several who are still running with you from, the, from before. Say hello. And then continue running after God, and after a while, look around again. When you see there is still someone running with you, you can invite them to come over and run together. Seek hard after God and find someone who has the same or complementary calling as your own, so that you can seek God and follow Him together. 
And then in verse, verses 5 through 6, this is she singing here. How right they are to adore you. Dark am I, yet lovely daughters of Jerusalem. Dark like the tents of Kedar, like the tent curtains of Solomon. Do not stare at me because I am dark, because I am darkened by the sun. My mother's sons are ang were angry with me and make me take and made me take care of the vineyards, my own vineyard. I had to neglect. When she's talking about her own vineyard, it her, here is herself. The girl has been praising the man that she loves. And she now moves to herself, and the tone changes noticeably. Her first description of herself is she is dark skinned, from verse 6. And we can see that she is embarrassed by this fact that it was not only considered beautiful to be dark in that in that culture, in that culture, it was not considered. Her brothers had her work in the vineyards, and she was darkened by the sun. By this, we know that she, you know, she knew how to work. She was a hard worker. She hadn't been pampered right growing up. She hadn't grown lazy and selfish. She had been taught to work. Guys, look for a girl that knows how to work. On the flip side, girls, look for a guy that knows how to work. You know, they may not, they may not be the best cook or carpenter or whatever else, but they should have a good work ethic. They will need to know how to help around the house and be willing to do so. Well, the girl is embarrassed about the darkness of her skin. She still knows that she's lovely. She's a beautiful girl. She has some insecurities about her parents, but she is still knows she is worthy to be treasured. She compares herself to the kids of Kedar in the curtains of Solomon. Kedar here refers to an Arab Bedouin or nomadic desert tribe. They lived in tents. That's the shelters of Arab Bedouin. One may surmise the tents of Kedar were probably made of tan hides or coarse, plant, coarse sackcloth that were dark in color. They also must have been very sturdy since they had to withstand the rigors of the wind, the sand, the heat, and the occasional storm as only other shelters that travelers could possess. They may have been described as tough, reliable tents. The curtains of Solomon, by contrast, would have been of the finest craftsmanship and would have been an exquisite detail. Perhaps the curtains would have interwoven colors and beads or even pearls as well as lace-like patterns. Therefore the woman claims that she is dark like the tents of Kedar and she is equally as sturdy as those tents. But she is also beautiful like the curtains of Solomon and worthy to receive the admiration given to princesses. She has insecurities, but she knows she is worthy and respected and praised. Women, respect yourselves. You have been created by God in just the way He wants you to be. Romans 9.21 says, The thing molded will not say to the molder, Why did you make me like this? Will it? This verse is saying that he has made you for his purpose and delights in you. Don't feel that you have to settle for any guy that will accept you. You know, you can acknowledge your weaknesses and You'll likely have insecurities, but know that God created you just the way He wants you to be. You're a creation of child and a child of God. In the King of yours, you're worthy of respect. Men, every girl, just as every boy, wants to be respected. Some girls, just as some boys, have developed low views of themselves and think and act as though they are not worthy to and do, do, do not desire respect, but every person desires to be respected. Take time to really listen to your wife or girlfriend and to understand her thoughts. It's also common for girls to have more insecurities about their bodies. 
there's more often more emphasis on female beauty and, and girls are keenly aware of the ways in which they don't meet the cultural standards. Recognize their insecurities and build the girl up rather than making her feel more insecure and inferior. As you are a man with whom she is safe, respected, and encouraged. She'll be able to open her heart more deeply to you and you can find the diamonds that are hidden inside. And then in verse 7 it says, Tell me, you whom I love, where you graze your flock and where you rest your sheep at midday. Why should I be like a veiled woman beside the flocks of your friends? And then verse 8, where the friends are speaking, if you do not know, most beautiful of women, follow the tracks of the sheep and graze your young goats by the tents of the shepherds. You know, the girl desires her man here, but she doesn't know where he is. She doesn't, she doesn't want to go look for him since she's concerned about what it will look like to others. She is then given the advice to go back to look, go look for her lover. It's interesting to note that in verses 1, 1 through 4 shows the lover as the king. We now see the lover as a shepherd. We see the ways in which the girl views her man changing in different situations. The girl desires her, desires her husband and she knows where he may be with the flocks, but she is afraid to go looking for him. We have seen in verse 6 that she has a less than favorable view of her brothers. You know, this may influence her view of men in general. She is afraid to enter into the world of her lover, the world of men. You know, her friends are Solomon, depending on whom you hold speaking in verse 8, tell her that they, what, what they see as the obvious answer. Go look for your man. Go to the sheep. They even go so far as to say that she should become a shepherd. She should enter into her lover's world. Women, just as you want your man to spend time with you, he wants you to spend time with him. Just as you want him to understand you, your desires, your enjoyments, your work, your life more. He desires these things also. You, like Solomon, beloved, may be afraid to enter into his world, but you may feel like an outsider in that world. For many girls, the world of men can be a strange and scary thing. However, to enter his, truly enter his heart, you need to enter into his life. You know, there needs to be times when he enters your world and when the two of you have time alone by yourselves. But there also needs to be times when you enter into his world, meet his co-workers, participate in, a, in the activities he enjoys, express your concerns to your man, and then draw courage to enter into his world. Man. It will likely not be so scary for you to enter into your beloved's world. However, it may be equally strange and seem equally undesirable to you. But it is really important. Both of you need to enter to each other's worlds to more fully understand each other's joys and desires and as well as the pains and fears. Both men and women, while well, it's important to make efforts to enter each other's worlds, no matter how strange or scary they may, may be, it's also important to recognize that this may be an undesired proposition for your spouse. Guys, you may desire your beloved to get into a football game with you, but you also may need to understand and be appreciative when she is willing to stand on the sidelines and cheer. You know, perhaps you can have a private time to play basketball together. This could create an in-between ground that you can both enjoy. Ladies, you may be glad that your husband comes with you for a shopping trip, but if you're going for a full day manicure, you may want to go with the other girls and give your husband a one-minute summary of your day over dinner. 
You know, it's important that we enter into each other's worlds, but it's also important that we recognize how much we can, we can request of our beloved. It's also important to work on developing activities that can be enjoyed together. And then in verse 9 and 10, 9 through 11 actually, it is he speaking, where it says, I liken you, my darling, to a mare among Pharaoh's chariots of horses. Your cheeks are beautiful with earrings, your neck with strings of jewels. We will make you earrings of gold studded with silver. We now find ourselves enjoying the wedding day. The groom, Solomon, sees his bride dressed in her wedding clothes and is captivated by her beauty. Men, if you have any of you in your quest to be biblical about your wooing of your wife had quoted this verse, I compare you with my darling to a horse, you may have found that it was not as effective as it might have been for Solomon. However, we read his beloved's response in verses 12, 14, see that she continued, continues to praise and express her love for him. Women, while well, is it true that charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to, de is to be praised. In Proverbs 31.30, that it does not mean that we are able or, or not to take care of ourselves. According to Dr. William, uh, Willard, he uh, Willard Harley, excuse me, in his book, His, his Needs, Her Needs, one of a man's greatest needs is a relationship. He needs a good-looking wife. He then explains that attractiveness is what you do with what you have. You don't need to be the most naturally beautiful woman in the world, but try your best to look good. That means a need that it meets a need for your husband. And man, most women don't have the same need for a handsome husband that women have for an attractive wife. However, men, it is still important you take care of yourself. Also, be willing to allow your wife to spend some money to buy some nice clothes. Just as Solomon was having earrings of gold and studded silver made for his wife, you can invest in clothes to your wife that will make her look more beautiful. So in verse 12, the she, 12 through 14 actually, she is speaking, well, the king was at his table, my perfume spread its fragrance. My beloved is to me a sachet of myrrh resting between my breasts. My beloved to me a cluster of henna blossoms from the vineyards of En Gedi. You know, as Solomon delighted in the beauty of his bride on their wedding day, the bride now delights in her husband. She is looking forward to his, take for, to his taking her to his bride as his bride and their physical intimacy that the evening is going to bring. In the original Greek, Greek the word translated table or couch is simply circle. Young's liberal trans or literal translation may have the most accurate translation with while the king is in his circle. Given this vague reference, the Hebrew, uh, Hebrew has been often translated as on his couch or at his table. However, it could be referring to his embracing her, encircling her. It may be that this ambiguity was intentional to catch both the official wedding banquet together with friends and family as well as the private wedding banquet that they would have as they enjoyed each other later in the evening. Whether referring to her groom as laying on his couch, sitting at his table, or embracing her, the sexual meaning and desire is evident as we look at verse 13. In the circle is a couch or bed. Then the intimate implications are obvious. You know, it's a banquet. The idea is possibly that the groom will feast as if the banquet upon the pleasures of the woman pro provides to him. This type of imagery can also say be seen in Psalm 2, 4, and 6. 
when he has brought her into his banquet hall, and his left hand is under his head, and his right hand embraces her. In other words, he has brought her to feast on the pleasures that she brings. Also in Psalms uh, 416, we hear the bride saying, Let my beloved come into his garden and taste his choice fruits. And in Psalm 7a, we get a glimpse of the choice fruits. May your breasts be like clusters of grapes, and the fragrance of your breath like apples. The girl wants her perfume to give forth its fragrance and to draw her man to herself, that he may delight in her fruits. In verse 13, she then continues to long for the physical intimacy that they will experience at the end of their wedding day. She compares him to a pouch of myrrh which will lie between her breasts. She desires for her husband to enjoy her fruits, to bring forth of them into sexual intimacy and pleasure. She longs for her lover to be intimate with her. This is her wedding day. In verse 14, she also compares her lover to a cluster of henna blossoms in the vineyards of Engedi. And it was a bush that grows about 10, 10 feet or 3 meters tall and has white fragrant flowers that may have been used for making perfumes. She refers to them being places among the vineyards to add the vineyards appearance and fragrance. And Getty was an oasis known to have been had carefully tended vineyards where Solomon's father David found rest after being chased by Saul in 1 Samuel 23-28. To this girl, her groom is a place of safety and beauty. She delights in him and looks forward to entering his tender, intimate embrace. Some commentators explain that at a wedding celebration, the men, including the groom, would sit at one table and the women, including the bride, would sit at another. During the evening, the bride would retire easily, early to prepare for her husband to come to their private room. Meanwhile, the groom would continue to party and drink with his friends. When he was done partying, he too would go to meet with his bride, who would be waiting for him sitting on the side of their bed with a red veil over her face. The groom would then lift the veil and praise his bride. This was the first time he, would seen, he had seen her for that day, or possibly their whole lives without a veil. They would then consummate their marriage. You know, in such a culture, a bride may too have desired that her perfume get forth its fragrance and drift to her lover who was dining at his table. The two important qualities are found in this, in this passage, desire and restraint. The girl longs for deep sexual intimacy with her man. She longs for this evening, their wedding night, when he will, for the first time, lay with her and delight in her physically and she in him. There is definite longing, and yet there is definite restraint. She longs for her groom, her lover, and yet this, their wedding night is the first time they will fulfill this desire. God delights in sexuality. He created it. He created the male and female bodies to work together for great delight. He created sex to be an act that can touch our souls. It can draw a man and wife closer together. It can make deep bonds between them. God delights in our sexuality, and he wants us to enjoy it in a way that he knows is best. He has given us sexuality and creation. He has showed us his delight in sexuality in his song of songs, 
and has instructed us on how to best enjoy his gifts throughout his word. We are told in Hebrews 13, 4, marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and all the sexual and sexually immoral. He clearly tells us that sexuality is to be enjoyed, to be delighted in, but only within the covenant of marriage. He explains some of his reasoning in 1 Corinthians 6.16. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her body? For it is said the two will become one flesh. You know, when a man and woman are joined together to sex, they have become as one flesh. The verse specifically refers to a prostitute, but can be applied to any male-female sexual encounter. Then we are reminded just a few verses later that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and that we are God's and not our own. This is because we have been bought with a price and are to glorify God with our body in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. So the main application which will be repeated again and again throughout this book is delight in your sexuality. Delight in intimate physical union with your husband or your wife. As we will see as we read Psalms 5, 1, I have come to you into my garden, my sister, my bride. I have gathered my myrrh and my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine and my milk. Eat, friends, and drink. Drink your fill of love. And then in verses 15 through 17, 15 is him speaking, How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful your eyes are does. And she in verse 16, How handsome you are, my beloved. Oh, how charming. Our bed is verdant. Is verdant. And he in 17, the beams of our house are cedars, our rafters are firs. The lovers are praising and expressing their desire from a, each, for each other. In these verses, they can you continue their self of their exchange of praises to the quick and complimentary remarks they're making here. The transition of this passage is pretty straightforward. The only uncertainty is who is speaking in verse 17. You know, it may be that the man is speaking, as it, as it does in the NIV, or that the woman is speaking. It doesn't really make a difference here. Either way, it doesn't affect the meaning of the passage. The woman's praise of the man is, is handsome in verse 16 is simply the male form of the word beautiful in verse 15. The Hebrew is nearly identical. So the man begins by praising his bride. The meaning of your eyes or does is not clear, but obviously a form of praise within the context of praising her beauty. The bride then echoes his praise as a man is handsome and pleasant to be with. Where it says the reference to verdant means that it is green, but it's not the color of a tree that is alive and in leaf and bloomed. By describing their bed in this way, she is referring to deep sexual pleasure which they are about to experience together. Verse 17 then continues this joy description by making their whole house one of pleasure and seclusion from the rest of the world. They are alone to delight in each other. Now finally, there is the privacy of the bedroom. He has lifted her veil and seen his bride for the first time. He begins to praise her, you're beautiful, and says that her eyes are beautiful. She then echoes his praising and draws his attention to their marriage bread. They're both excited to consummate their marriage and to drink deep of sexual pleasure in one another. The application here is, there's three applications that we find throughout the book. First is passionately divide, delight in your spouse. 
The second is praise each other and do it all in a way that God has created and knows is best. And three, in the case of sex, it needs to be within marriage. So in closing here, we have looked into this chapter, we have seen the couple desire each other. We have seen their desire grow as they move closer to their wedding day. We have seen this desire not only as physical and sexual, but as emotional as well. We have seen them praise one another and delight each other's presence. We will continue to see these themes repeated throughout the book together with an urgent plea not to arouse their awakened love until the proper time, as it will tell us in Psalm 3.5. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for your word. It's, you know, these precious verses here that you don't hear much in church, Lord. It's not something in most churches that is, uh, that is put out there, but we know it. it's in your word and it's to be expressed, Lord, it's to be studied and lifted up to your people. And we thank you, Lord, that you put it in such a beautiful way to show us how our marriages should be and how we, how our, uh, our time before marriage and the romantic parts and how they should be and then into our marriage and of the deep affection we should have for each other and how it goes on during our marriage and in our lives. So we thank you, Lord, for these words of wisdom tonight. We love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, beloved. I'll see you next week.